It's great to be with you all this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Joe Martin comes to his hill where I um, am the director. And there, he's there twice a year. And um, I think it's by his influence that I'm here today. Um, and I appreciate Job and his family a lot, I've known them for a long time. Um, I, as Don said, I direct a, a Bible school, college level ministry in Texas. It's part of a larger organization called Torchbearers International. You may have heard of Ian Thomas, Major Ian Thomas. Um, he wrote Saving Life of Christ, The Indwelling Life of Christ, The Mystery of Godliness, If I Perish, I Perish. Um, he was a British war hero, and um, the Lord used him to start um, a Bible school in England, uh, in the Lake District, one-year program, and it was largely focused at the, at the initial stages on reaching German and Austrian youth after World War II, so as to introduce them um, to Christ. And um, th from that, he never had any intention for this to happen, but Bible schools sprang up literally around the world, and we have 25 centers around the world now. And at any given time, there's about 1,000 students that are studying within torchbearers every year. Um, at our school in Texas, um, we're probably about average size, 40 to 60 students each year, and they come from, from 6 to 10 countries in any given year. Few students, but they come from all over the world. So probably half our student population every year is from Canada, and then we get a lot of Germans and Austrians and um, Australians and people from everywhere. So I have um, three boys and a daughter and my three sons all married Canadians um, because they were coming down to his hill and studying, and I kind of thought the odds were pretty good that that would happen. So three Canadian girls from three different provinces. Um, so fortunately, they still live in Texas with us. So yeah, I've I'm, I'm, um, been married um, to my wife, Patsy. Um, I was talking to Diane, and she's from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. My wife's from Lancaster County. We know at least one person, the mutual friends, and so I married way above myself by marrying from good Pennsylvania stock, and I'm very thankful for my wife. We have four grown children. Um, the oldest is 31, the youngest is 26, three boys, one girl. They're all married, and they're giving us lots of grandchildren right now, so we're very thankful for that. So we're very blessed. The ministry at His Hill, um, and this isn't to be a long introduction, but the main thing that Ian Thomas had on his heart um, throughout his life was he really wanted Christians to come to understand the significance of Christ living in them. And I heard someone once say, not Ian Thomas, but somebody else, um, he had just taken a, a, a pastorate um, at a church, and he had been on staff at his hill for a long time. And I called him up and asked him how he was doing. And he said, I am having the time of my life leading Christians to Christ. And I thought, I've never heard it put that way before. And he wasn't saying that he was seeing Christians getting saved. They were already saved. Thank you, John. But he was saying the ministry of the Holy Spirit is always and singularly to lead everyone to Jesus. He leads unbelievers to Jesus, and he leads believers to Jesus. Everybody needs to be led to Christ. And that is his one objective. He wants to exalt Christ by leading everyone, believer and unbeliever, to Christ. And that's really what the ministry of Torchbearers is about. We want Christians to be led to Christ and to understand in particular, the significance of what it means that He indwells us, that He lives us in us. And basically, it means we don't just live for Him, but we live from Him. He is the means and the resource for everything that He requires of us. So I want to look at this passage here in um, Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at the temptation accounts of Christ. And... Um, it's, um, it's a great passage to go to, to look at how God intended for man to live. And so we'll start actually at the, at the end of chapter 3 in Matthew. The temptation account is not unique here to Matthew, but I, I like this one uh, for a couple of reasons that we'll see. And so at the end of chapter 3, Jesus is being baptized, and everyone acknowledges that's the beginning of his public ministry. 
And then the last thing that happens there at his baptism is that the Father speaks to him from heaven and says in verse 17, And behold, a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the Father is well pleased with his Son, the Lord Jesus. And in the very next verse, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So there's no problem here. Obviously, we would know that. The Father is well pleased with him, and yet Matthew states the first, um, well, the introduction to the temptation account here in such a way that's unique. Luke just says he was taken into the wilderness and he was tempted. But Matthew makes it, it's purposeful. Now, we understand God does not tempt. James is very clear on that that God has never tempted anyone. He does not tempt. But Jesus, according to Matthew, was led into the wilderness by the Spirit so that he would be tempted, to be tempted by the devil. Now, that's a unique thought. Now, I appreciate um, what one person wrote here. I think it was, it was Dwight Pentecost that he pointed out that this is um, a confrontation by, of Christ against the devil. That this is Jesus who is coming toe-to-toe with Satan. And Jesus is the aggressor here. We typically look at this as Satan is the aggressor, and he is an aggressor. There's no doubt about it. And he comes against us constantly. But in the way that Matthew's writing this is that The Spirit has something to prove about Jesus. And so the Spirit puts Jesus into this position knowing what's going to happen. God's not tempting Jesus, but God fully is aware of what's going to happen. And it's almost like he's saying, come on, Satan, give give him your best shot. And after this passage here, and beginning in chapter 5, is the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount, as we all know, Jesus is legislating as king what is many take to be essentially the constitution for his kingdom, the Sermon on the Mount. Well, what right does he have to tell us what to do? None if he is a sinner. But if he is without sin, then he has the moral authority to declare what we should be doing. And so chapter 4, the temptation account, proves his moral authority. You and I have no moral authority because we're sinners. And so even when we tell our children what to do or our grandchildren what to do, hopefully it's with humility and with grace, understanding that the only authority we have is what, is, what God has given to us, and we are not inherently um, sinless. And so we do not have intrinsically the moral authority to tell anyone what to do. I remember one year um, I was on staff at His Hill. I was doing an internship there after Bible college. I went to Columbia International University and then was at His Hill for a year and then went to Dallas Seminary. And in that year where I was just an intern, we took um, some of the students in a bus over to the neighboring town for pizza one evening. And on the way back, it's dark and I'm driving the bus. And all the lights are out on the bus, and, and I could see that things didn't look right behind me as I looked in my mirror and looked down the rows of all the students. These are college-age students, from, um, remember? And, but we got, had, a, had a rule at his hill, and that was that, that dating couples could not show physical contact with each other. So no kissing, none of that stuff. While you're, there's just one year that you're in Bible college, hands off. And so I'm looking, driving and looking in the mirror and it doesn't, I mean, it just, people look like something's going on. So I flip on the light and people scramble like roaches when the light comes on. And I'm just going, this isn't good. And so I turn the light back off and soon it looked like everybody was in each other's seats again. Turn the light back on, they jump back to where they're supposed to be. That happened three times. Well, there's two staff guys on the bus and they're just sitting there looking straight ahead, not saying a word. And they're older than me. They're staff guys. I'm an intern. And so we finally get back to his hill, and I flip the light on, and I'm just agonizing. What can I? I know I have to say something because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. 
And I remember pulling over and, and asking the girls to get off the bus so I could just talk to the guys. And the whole thing that's making this so difficult for me is I know I don't have the moral authority to tell these students what they're doing is wrong because I've done just as bad. So how can I confront them without being a hypocrite? And so I was really asking God for grace and wisdom. And I said to these guys, I, I have no right, no moral authority in myself to confront you because I'm a sinner and we're all sinners. But this isn't about breaking his hill's rules. And this isn't about me being a staff member. This is about you and Christ and what you've agreed to. And so I, I confronted them and I encouraged them and I challenged them, not on the basis of my righteousness, but on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you know what? They could accept that because I'm not just preaching from on high, but as a brother to a brother saying, I'm no better than you are. I have no more, no more moral authority than you do, but Christ is our righteousness. And this is not true to him. And they go, we can accept that. Thanks. And it went beautifully. So this passage is establishing the moral authority of Christ. He has the right to tell us what to do because he is without sin. So there are, as you know, three temptations. You also know that Jesus was in the wilderness and he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. So he was at the point of starvation. He became hungry. And then the tempter, because that's what he is, not God, but the devil is the tempter, came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Could Jesus do that? Absolutely. Created this world out of nothing. He can surely turn rocks into bread. Turned water into wine. He can turn rocks into bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Second temptation. The devil took him into the holy city, Jerusalem, and stood him up on the pinnacle of the temple. We believe that this would have been on the corner of the temple where below was the Kidron Valley. And so it's estimated that this would have been as high as 450 feet up. Pretty high building. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, and he was, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Third temptation. And the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you. And he is the God of this world, so he could give those things if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and began to minister to him. And that establishes the sinlessness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you've probably heard that the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, um, and, and those three things that are mentioned in 1 John are, are definitely demonstrated here. But I want to look at this a little different way. Um, one, we also know that the three roles of Jesus as prophet, priest, and king are being assailed by the devil. As prophet, prophet is one who speaks forth the word of God. Jesus was to speak, and the rocks would turn to bread. So that was assailing his, his role as prophet. As priest, Jesus came to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, and, Je and Satan took him to the temple and stood him up on the temple and said, throw yourself down, and the angels will come and intercede on your behalf. Well, a priest was not, to inter to, to, um, was not one who, who was supposed to be needing intercession or having inter people intercess for him, but he came to be the intercessor. He said, come, throw yourself down, and the angels will intercede for you. That was not the role of, of Jesus as priest. He came to be an intercessor, not to be interceded for. 
and then his role as king. I will show showed him all the kingdoms of the world. I'll, I'll give them to you if you will bow down to me. And so his role as king is being attacked. But there's something else here that helps me more than those things do. If you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, Jesus was hungry, very hungry, 40 days without eating. But what what is the sin in turning rocks into bread? Because the devil is tempting him to sin. That is the goal of all temptation, to get us to sin. So what would be the sin for Jesus to turn rocks into bread? He turned water into wine, and it was not sin. He created this world out of nothing, and it was not sin. So I asked myself, why is it sin to turn rocks into bread? There is no sin in being hungry. Or around 12 o'clock, we will all be in sin, right? There's no sin in in being hungry. That is a legitimate, natural need. The sin, it would seem, is in Jesus meeting a legitimate need in his own strength, independent of the will of God for him. I find that this is one of the basic temptations that we all face. The temptation to provide for ourselves rather than to wait upon God to provide for us. I teach First, Second Kings every year. In fact, a lot of times because I teach at some of the other torchbearer schools and they always ask me to do First and Second Kings. And it's, it strikes me that as soon as God raises up Elijah and Elijah goes and confronts Ahab, the very next thing that God does is hide him at a brook for a long time. And during those days at the brook, the drought lasted for three and a half years. He spent part of the time at the brook and part of the time in Zarephath with the widow. We don't know how long at each, at each place. But I would imagine it was at least a year at the brook. And during that time, he did nothing. He didn't witness to anybody. He didn't write any books. He didn't preach any sermons. He did nothing. He simply sat at a brook. And he was exactly where God wanted him to be. God was doing nothing with that man. But he was in the center of God's will. You ever think about that? We think when nothing's happening in our life, it must be there's something wrong. What have I done to neutralize my effectiveness before God? And we think God's big agenda for us is to make us effective. I don't see that in Scripture. God's big agenda for us is to know Christ and to walk with him. Enoch walked with God and was no more. And there is no record of anything God ever did with him or through him. Not a single miracle, nothing. But he walked with God and God said, come on home to heaven. No record of anything God did with or through that man. And yet he was more intimate with God than any other man who had lived up to, those, up to that time. And with Elijah, God puts him at a brook where he's doing nothing, accomplishing nothing, and he's exactly where God wants him to be. But in those days, he is learning who his God is. And God's becoming big, and Elijah's becoming small. And Elijah is seeing, yeah, I need to eat, but God doesn't need me to provide for myself. Yeah, I need protection, but God doesn't need me to protect myself. And the two biggest needs we have for protection and provision, God was doing both and showing this man, I've raised you up and I will use you, but make no mistake, I don't need you. And it is not about me using you, it's about you coming to understand who I am. Oswald Chambers one time said, God did not save us in order to show the world what a great person he could make out of you and me. He saved us in order to show the world what a great God he is. And it's not about us. It's about him. And so here Jesus is saying, you know, I'm hungry, very hungry, but I will not eat. I will not prepare my own food. And I could until my father says it's time to eat. That's pretty amazing. Prepared to die 
rather than to provide for himself. Wow. I, you know, that, that is so unique, isn't it? You know, we, we think we spend so much of our life focused on providing for ourselves, providing for our children, providing for their college, providing for our retirement, all of life. In one way or another, we're, we're, we're just constantly dealing with this. And we have to deal with it. But to come to that place of recognizing that any provision that we make for ourselves, no matter how legitimate the need is, if that is done in independence of God, it is sin. So that's the first temptation, tempting Jesus to provide for himself independent of the Lord. So he says, and the, and the key there is to provide for himself. So the second temptation, verse 5, the devil took him up in the holy city, stood him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. What is this temptation? Yes, it, it, it strikes against his role as priest. But even more simple, perhaps, than that, it is a temptation to get Jesus to prove himself publicly. I mean, you think, Jerusalem's a crowded city, always has been, and the temple is the focus of the city. And Jesus is standing on the temp pinnacle of the temple, 450 feet up. I can't imagine nobody was seeing that. And, and it, would just, it just appears to me this would have been a public spectacle. And had he stepped off that temple, the angels probably would have come and saved him. And maybe thousands of people would have seen it. And everybody would have known at that moment something is different about this man that the angels would come and save him. I believe the temptation here is to prove himself. And it runs strong in all of us. When I became the director at His Hill, we had an international staff conference in England. We do that every four years. And so um, I was introduced as the new director in Texas. And um, I was 32 and looked like I was 18. And so and I told everybody there, three, 400 people that were gathered, that I was the oldest person on staff. And you could just hear gasp all around the room because they're thinking, this 18-year-old, and he's got a bunch of 16-year-olds working for him, and, and, and people are going, oh, my word. And, and so it, it really, I think, rattled Major Thomas, Ian Thomas, who appointed me to the position because he could see how everybody was going, oh, my word, we have to pray for his hill. And so I was discouraged, frankly. And as I was walking out of the room, Major Thomas came up to me and put his hand on my shoulder, which was usually not a good thing because he was a quite intimidating guy. Nobody wanted to talk to him. You just kind of walked around him a bit. And so I thought, oh, now I'm in for it. And he, and he came up and put his hand on my shoulder. And I'll never forget, he, he said, Charlie, I never want to hear what you are doing at his hill. I just want to hear what Jesus is doing at his hill. And it took all the pressure off of me. He couldn't have said anything better to me at that time because I had all this weight. I have to succeed. I have to prove myself. And Major says, there's nothing you have to do. Jesus will prove himself if you get out of the way and you yield to him. This is a temptation that doesn't go away. And maybe it's stronger in men. I don't know. But I know it's very strong in us as men. We spend our lives wanting to be respected and, and feeling that we have to prove ourselves. When David was at the end of his life, he fell to this temptation. When he was a teenage boy, we don't know exactly how old, 16, 17 years old maybe, he went out and fought a, a, a giant, Goliath. And he killed him. And he had nothing to prove. David didn't step on that battlefield because he says, I'm going to show everybody how good I am with a slingshot. He stepped on that battlefield because he had one concern in mind, and that was God and his name. And he was not there trying to prove anything. Good for you, David. David ruled as king 
his entire life knowing that God put him on the throne and he was nothing more than a shepherd boy that God had, had exalted. He never lived as king trying to prove himself until the end of his life. And at 70 years old, 1 Kings chapter 1, he can't stay warm at night, and his servants come to him with a plan. Let us find the most beautiful virgin girl in Israel and bring her to you and put her in your bed, and that will keep you warm. And so they did. And the scripture says that David went through with the plan, but he did not cohabit with her. They didn't have sexual relations. In the very next verse, now, as soon as it became known that David didn't have sex with that girl, now, Adonijah, the oldest surviving son of David, says, this is my time to be king. Something's going on there. That was not a situation about David just needing to be warm at night. Because David had eight wives. And any one of those eight wives, 50 years old to 70 years old, could have been more than accurate to keep David warm at night. They didn't need to go find a 20-year-old virgin girl to put in David's bed. What they were trying to do was to establish whether David still had the physical strength to father a child. That's what that was about. Because in their minds, if you're too weak to father a child then you're too weak to be king. And so they were trying to get David to prove he still had what it took to be a king. And David failed that test. And that's why his son said, now's my chance to be king because my father, if he's too weak to even father a child with the most beautiful woman in Israel, then he's too weak to oppose me. And he exalted himself to be king. David, at the end of his life, at 70 years old, falls to a temptation that he had resisted so well throughout his life. The temptation to say, I need to prove myself. We are not here to prove ourselves. We have nothing to prove. But God will prove himself as we yield to him and walk in faith and obedience. We don't have to establish anything. God puts us in a position. God vindicates his choice. Isn't that a life of peace and rest? When you have nothing to prove, it is a life of peace and rest. I don't have to prove what a good parent I am. I don't have to prove what a good husband I am. I don't have to prove anything. Trust in Jesus. Walk in humble obedience to Him. And He will vindicate what He has done. That He puts us in those positions. And He will vindicate what He has done. We don't have anything to prove. And then the last temptation, the devil took him up onto a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Do you notice that this is the only one of the three temptations where the devil doesn't say, if you are the son of God? The first time, if you're the son of God, turn the rocks into bread. The devil knows he's the son of God. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down and the angels will come. He knows he's the son of God. And the third time, he doesn't say that. Luke rearranges the order here, and he has this, the third temptation second. And so you see the contrast even more than what you would here in Matthew. And I've come to think the devil is very cunning. And there are times when he wants us to remember who we are. And there are other times he does not want us to remember who we are. Right? So there's sometimes... When you like, when, especially when you've messed up, when you've sinned, the devil's going to beat you up with who you are. You call yourself a child of God? You think you're a Christian? This is the way a Christian behaves? Boom, boom, just hammering us with who we are. And there's other times he does not want to remind you of who you are, especially when he wants to tempt you to take something, to acquire something, to possess something which is already your birthright. See, Jesus is the King of Kings. The nations of the world are his birthright. But the father had established that he would not rule as king yet. And that day is still coming when he will rule over the, over the nations of the earth with a rod of iron. That day hasn't come yet. But before that day can come, the father has said, you're going to suffer and die. And so the devil's offering him a shortcut. 
You don't have to suffer and die. All you got to do is worship me and you'll get all the kingdoms right now. Shortcuts seem good. I like shortcuts. But Jesus understands what's going on here. And it's not the acquiring of the kingdoms that is sinful. It is acquiring them outside of the will of God, independently of the Lord. There's no sin in being king of kings. The sin would be taking them on his own, independent of what the Lord has for him. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. I will worship the Lord God and serve him only. Temptation is a shortcut to what is good, not to what is bad, one person has said. No one will ever be raised above temptation. That belongs to God only. Jesus, by the way, is being tempted as man. God cannot be tempted and does not tempt anyone. So it is in his humanity that he's being tempted, and that's why these are lessons for you and me. We are tempted like Jesus to provide for ourselves, to prove ourselves, and to possess for ourselves. They are temptations that, that speak to self-preservation, provide for yourself, self-exaltation, prove yourself, and self-gratification, possess for yourself. We don't want to wait. We all say, thank God for Visa, right? Because we don't have to wait. Just put it on the credit card. Self-preservation, self-exaltation, and self-gratification. Rather than just saying, I'm going to wait on God. And if I have to die waiting on God, I would rather die trusting Him than to move into independence from Him. There's only one way to live, and God has intended that man live in complete dependence upon God for his preservation, for his for his worth, for his exaltation, and for his gratification. That Jesus is truly the source. Romans eleven thirty six 36 says, from him and through him and to him are all things. And God has never intended that we do anything separate from him in independence of him. Couldn't be more basic. Satan does not tempt us, as one person said, to gross sins. The one thing he tempts us to is putting myself as master instead of God. And again, this is, this is where the, the rubber hits the road. Scripture says that Jesus was tempted in every manner in which a person can be tempted and was without sin. I've come to think that these three temptations pretty much summarize the whole scope of temptation. In one way or another, every temptation seems to be about either proving myself possessing for myself, providing for myself, it all seems to come down to those three things in one way or another. And so Satan is simply trying to get me to act for myself rather than in dependence upon God. We have these wonderful college students that come to us every year from around the world. I feel like God just, just surveys the world and just picks out 50 of the best to send to us. And they are remarkable people. And I don't care where you're from. Any country in the world, we're all the same. We're facing the same temptations. We have the same enemy. And the, goal has the, and the enemy has the same goal. To simply get us to try to live life in our own strength. In independence of the Lord. It's not complicated. And God says there's only one way that you've been man, made. Men and women cannot live as God has intended, by living in their own strength. We are creatures dependent upon the Creator, and that is never going to change. Ian Thomas used to say, God gave to animals instinct. So how do they make it through this, this world? They don't have any books to read. They have nobody to really guide them. Instinct. And it's amazing what the animal world does simply on the basis of instinct. And Ian Thomas says, God didn't give that to you and me. We're not animals. Animals function beautifully in this world simply on the basis of instinct. He didn't give that to people. His intention for you and I is to be guided by his indwelling presence. And so man without God is like an animal without instinct. 
He is truly lost. We need God's indwelling presence. And that comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. But that faith in Christ that saved us doesn't then become, now I've trusted Jesus alone for my salvation. I believe in Christ and I am saved. I appreciate the ministry of uh, Grace Evangelical Society that you guys support them. Bob Wilkin comes out here and, and preaches. And I've been to you know, some of the conferences and things. And, and I appreciate that ministry deeply. When we are saved simply by faith alone in Christ alone. But then the question comes, well, then how do you live the Christian life? Well, Colossians 2, 6 says, as you received him, so walk in him. If I received him by faith, then I walk by faith for everything that I will need. And all the enemy's trying to do is not get me to do some gross sin, though he's pretty good at that. What he's after is to simply get good, moral, Christian people to not need their God, to function on their own. And he's won. Because how can God be glorified in a man or woman that's living from himself? He is the explanation for his being, rather than living from Christ, and Christ becomes the explanation for his being. God's not glorified in a man or woman that is living from himself as the source and power and explanation for his life rather than living from Christ. So I appreciate this passage a lot. I've come to it many, many times over the years. Helps me to understand that life is not complicated. We do have an enemy, but we have a victor. And he has defeated the enemy. And that one Christ lives in me. And all he's looking for me from moment to moment is to live in conscious dependence upon him. I don't have to be conscious of his presence, but I do need to live in conscious dependence upon him. And as I do, Christ is exalted. And I am living as the man God created me to live, to be. Amen? I'll close this in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word, and I thank you, God, um, for the life that you have lived as a man that we could see how men and women were designed to live. Not from their own wisdom and resources, talents and abilities, but to live truly in dependence on you, drawing from you life itself. You are our life. You have become to us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We have been blessed with every blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You are life itself. And I thank you, God, that you have not left us to ourselves, that we can live in dependence upon you as we've placed our faith in Christ and Christ has come to indwell us, that he might be the means for this life. In Jesus' name, amen.